Hello everyone, I'm Iman Shuvas Nanesh from the Department of Mechanical Engineering and I'm here to discuss with you on the subject Material Science. Subject code is ME207, unit number 4 in the series, lecture number 28. And today's topic are Copper Alloys, Bearing Materials, Tin and its Alloys. So, learning objectives for today's lecture are to provide the students with a basic understanding of Copper Alloys, Bearing Materials, Tin and its Alloys. And learning outcome of our today's lecture will be students have learned the basics of copper alloys, bearing materials, tin and its alloys. The students understood various types of copper alloys, tin and its alloys. So, see, we have discussed about various non ferrous metals in our previous lecture, and we have discussed about aluminium alloys in detail. So, now we are starting with copper and its alloys in detail. Okay, now copper. It is one of the most widely used non-ferrous metal in the industry and it is a soft, malleable and ductile material with a reddish brown appearance. So copper is having an appearance of a reddish brown appearance. Okay. Then its specific gravity is 8.9 and melting point is 1083 degree centigrade which is more than aluminium. The tensile strength varies from 150 MPa to 400 MPa under different conditions and it is a good conductor of electricity. Okay. It is used, largely used in making electric cables and wires for electric machinery and appliances, in electrotyping, in electroplating and in making coins and household utensils. It may be cast, forged, run, rolled and drawn into wires. See, we also know that copper has its main applications in electric cables and wire because it is a good control of electricity. Okay, in appliances also, it is extensively used. Okay, uh, so it is non-corrosive under ordinary conditions and resist weather very effectively. Now, copper in the form of tubes and is, is used widely in mechanical engineering, which is also used for making ammunition. So this application is very effective because it is used for making ammunition. Okay. Now it is also used for making useful alloys with tin, zinc, nickel and aluminium. Okay. Now we know that we, we have been using in certain mechanical engineering equipment there are copper tubes that are used. So you know that the application of copper is very extensive in our mechanical engineering department. Overall, the usage of copper in making electrical cables and wires also has its application in the industry to a very large extent. Okay, then copper alloys. See, these are classified and broadly into two major groups. That is, the first is the copper zinc alloy that we call as a brass. Very commonly known material in the industry nowadays, brass. This is actually a copper zinc alloy. Here, the copper is around 70% and zinc is around 30%. Okay. Then this brass is much harder and stronger than a pure copper. The most widely used copper zinc alloy is brass. Ah, there are various types of brasses. It is depending upon the proportions of copper and zinc. This is fundamentally a binary alloy of copper with zinc each 50%. Okay, so we know that the uh, brass is a combination of copper and zinc, and it is obviously the most widely used copper zinc alloy in the industry. So by adding small quantities of other elements like the properties of brass may be greatly changed. For example, the addition of lead, maybe from 1 to 2 percent, it will improve the machinability quality of brass. So this is something uh, you can say a revolution in the materials. It has greater strength than that of copper, but have a lower thermal and electrical conductivity. It is giving you addition of one thing that it will give you a good machining quality of brass, addition of lead. Okay, it will give you a good machinability of brass. But on the other hand, it is giving you lower thermal and electrical connectivity. So, depending upon the application you choose, what do you want to mix? Do you want to add other quantities or elements in this brass or not? Okay, depending on the applications, your decision is taken. Now, brasses are very resistant to atmospheric corrosion and can be easily soldered. Okay. Now, they can be easily fabricated by pressing like spinning 
and can be electroplated with metals like nickel and chromium. The following tables that you are showing in the next slide it shows the composition of various types of brasses according to Indian standards. Like now, this is the composition uses of brasses. Okay, the various kinds of brasses are like cartridge brass, yellow brass, leaded brass, admiratory brass, naval brass, nickel brass, like German silver or nickel silver. So here, when we talk about cartridge brass, it is like, like copper is around 70% and zinc is around 30% that we just discussed in the previous slide. Now, its usage, okay, it is a cold working brass used for cold roll sheets, wire drawing, deep drawings, pressings, and tube manufacture. Okay, so you may be used for cold roll sheets and wire drawing, deep drawing, pressing, and tube manufacture. Now, when we talk about yellow brass, which is also known as the Munch metal, in it, the copper is 60% and zinc is 40%. Okay, now here the quantity of zinc is increased in it. So it is suitable for hot working by rolling or extrusion or stamping. Now leaded brass is having copper 62.5%, lead 36%, and sorry, uh, zinc 36% and lead 1.5%. You can see the addition of lead is there. Then if you look about eliminatory brass, then it also has copper as 70%, zinc is 29%, and tin is 1%. Uh, in naval brass, you see that these are the two metals, the two materials like heated brass and admiratory brass, which is used for plates and tubes. Okay, now we talk about naval brass, so it is having copper uh, 59%, zinc 40%, and tin 1%. It is used for marine traffic. Now we talk about nickel brass, so called as German silver or nickel silver, that is, copper is around 60 to 45. Okay. Then zinc is around 35 percent, nickel is around 5 to 35 percent. So it is used for wall, plumbing, fittings, automobile fittings, many type of writer and musical instruments. So the applications vary depending upon the composition. Okay, now it, is, it was all about brass. Okay, so this is really good. Now let's discuss about this uh, a small diagram that is showing the various materials that are used to build a modern car. Now you can say that engine block is built from a metal alloy. You can see the laminated windscreen are made from layers of glass and plastics. So you can see the variety of materials. Now seat covered with leather, obviously the shell made from steel and coated with zinc and layers of paint to prevent rusting. Now there's synthetic rubber tires clipped to avoid road surfaces. Okay. Synthetic rubber tires clipped to road surfaces and then lacquered foam bumper. Then you can see the various kinds of materials that are used to build a modern car. Okay, so far we have been discussing about various materials. So that's why I took this uh, image, uh, image that is showcasing the different materials that are used in just a car. Okay. Now the second uh, copper alloy is like copper tin alloy. You can also call it a bronze. So the alloys of copper and tin are usually termed as bronze. And the useful range of in composition is 75 to 95 percent is copper and 5 to 25 percent is tin. What they say in bronze, the useful range of composition is around 75 to 95 percent copper and then 5 to 25 percent tin. That is really impressive. Now, the metal is compared comparatively hard, resist surface wear, and can be shaped. Or rolled into wires, rods, sheets very easily. This is really a good application. It can be rolled into wires and rods and sheets very easily. Now, in corrosion resistant properties, bronzes are superior to brass. Now, this is impressive. In corrosion resistant properties, the bronzes are superior to brasses. So, some of the common types of bronze are as follows in the next slide that. Now, phosphor bronze, okay. And you talk about when a phosphor bronze contains phosphorus, it is called as phosphor bronze. When bronze contains phosphorus, it is called as phosphorus bronze. Now, phosphorus increases the strength, ductility, and soundness of the casting. The tensile strength of this alloy when cast varies from 215 MPa to 280 MPa. But increases up to 2300 MPa, that is 2300 MPa when rolled or drawn. You can see how the tensile strength of this material varies. Okay. 
Ah, this alloy it possesses good wearing qualities. It has high elasticity. Moreover, the material is resistant to salt water corrosion. Okay, the composition of the metal varies according to whether it's to be forged, wrought, or made into castings. Okay, a common type of phosphor bronze has the following composition according to Indian standard: that is, copper is around 87 to 90 percent, tin is around 9 to 10 percent, as phosphorus is around 0.1 to 3 percent. Okay, its range is around 0.1 to 3 percent, which is a uh, according to the Indian standard of common composition that we have seen. Okay, but, but we know that the phosphorus obviously increases the strength, ductility and soundness of the casting. Now it is mostly used for bearing, worms, wheels, gears, nuts, for machine lead screws, pump parts, linings and for many other purposes. Now it is also suitable for making springs. You can see this a simple material named the phosphor bronze has wide applications in the industry like bearings and worm wheels and gears and nuts for machines, speed screws, pump parts, linings and other purposes, springs. Okay, so this is really a very famous or you can say most extensively used material also in the industries nowadays, which is impressive. Now the silicon bronze. Now, just just remember one thing: is the the well, the need for adding phosphorus in this is that it the phosphorus it increases the strength, ductility, and soundness of the casting. Just make it clear with you. Now, silicon bronze. Okay, now silicon bronze is also a very common material. It contains 96 percent copper, silicon only 3 percent, and 1 percent manganese or zinc. Understand? It has 96 percent copper. 3% silicon and 1% manganese or zinc. So it has good general corrosion resistance. It has good general corrosion resistance of copper combined with higher strength. Now it can be cast, rolled, stamped, forged, and pressed either hot or cold, and it can be welded by all the usual methods. Now it is widely used for boilers, tankers. Stoves where high strength and good corrosion resistance is required. Now they say the silicon bronze, another you can say alloy. Okay, it is giving us it's having around like 96 percent copper, 3 percent silicon, and 1 to 1 percent manganese or zinc. Okay, now this combination is widely used for boilers or tanks and stoves where high strength and good corrosion resistance is required. So this is also good. Now beryllium bronze. That is a copper based alloy containing about 97.75% copper and 2.25% beryllium. Now it has high yield point, high fatigue point limit, and excellent cold and hot corrosion resistance. Now it is particularly suitable material for springs, heavy duty electrical switches, camps, and bushings. Now, since the wear resistance of beryllium copper is five times that of Phosphor bronze. I repeat, since the wear resistance of beryllium copper is five times that of phosphor bronze, therefore it may be used as a bearing material in place of phosphor bronze. Why? Because it has wear resistance more than that of other material. So it has a film forming and a soft lubricating property which makes it more suitable as a bearing material. So beryllium bronze as an application may be more for a, as a bearing material than any other thing. Wherever it can be used for springs also, for some heavy duty electrical switches also, camps, bushing points. And uh, the proportion in which it is available that is, it is a copper alloy containing around copper 97.75% copper and 2.25% beryllium. Okay, so now that next is the manganese bronze. Now it is also an alloy of copper, zinc, and it is percentage of manganese. So the usual composition of this bronze is like copper 60%, zinc 35%, and manganese around 5%. Only 5% of manganese is there. Okay, now this metal is highly corrosion to resist, uh, to resistant to corrosion. It is harder, stronger than phosphor bronze. 
and it is generally used for bushes, plungers, feed pumps, rods, etc. Now, warm gears are frequently made from this bronze. Okay. Now, this is you can say this manganese bronze has the application more in warm in making of warm gears. Okay, and also apart apart from warm gears, also it is used for bushes or plungers and feed pumps and rods. Okay. So the combination of the composition of this manganese bronze is like copper is around 60%, zinc is around 35%, and manganese is around 5%. So this is good. Now, aluminium bronze. This is an alloy of copper and aluminium, and the aluminium bronze with 6 to 8%. 6 to 8% only aluminium has valuable cold working properties. Okay, when I mean cold working properties means that you are not heating the material, you are not providing any heat to the material, you are just working on the material at room temperature only. So it has good cold working properties. And the maximum tensile strength of this alloy is around 450 MPa with 11% of aluminum. Okay, now you can see the aluminum is increasing its tensile strength properties also. So they say that the maximum tensile strength of this alloy is around 450 MPa with 11% of aluminum. Now they are the most suitable for making components exposed to severe corrosion conditions. Okay, when iron is added to these bronzes, the mechanical properties are improved by refining the grain size and improving the ductility. Now here, the addition of iron is also uh, giving it addition to the properties. They are refining; they are the properties are improved by refining the grain size and improve the ductility. Okay, the addition of iron. To this kind of bronze, it is like the mechanical properties are improved by refining the grain size and improving the ductility. Now, aluminium bronze are widely used for making gears, propellers, condenser bowls, pump components, tubes, air pumps, live valves, and bushings. You can see the application of aluminium bronze gears, propellers, condenser bowls, pump components, tubes, air pumps. Slide walls, bushings, etc. The cams and rollers are also made from this alloy. The 6% aluminum alloy has a fine gold color which is used for imitation jewelry and decorative purposes. Now, this is the application. And only for 6% aluminum alloy, it has application in the imitation jewelry and decorative purposes. Okay, now this is something about aluminum products. Ah, now in the engineering industries, in copper, zinc, nickel, and chromium in their pure and alloyed forms have been used as materials in situations where high tensile strength is required at elevated temperatures. Okay, then you require high ductility and malleability are required. Where high resistance to heat is required. Where high electrical conductivity is required. Okay, so in most in about the fields and situation, mostly non ferrous metals are used. Okay, so these elements that we have discussed above, okay, these are used in the following situations that we just discussed, like high ductility and malleability is required, is high resistance to heat is required, high electrical conductivity is required, and high tensile strength is required at elevated temperatures. We have been discussing about all these in this just few slides also. Now, properties of copper, some common properties of copper, it is a soft, strong, tough, malleable and ductile material. It is very malleable and ductile so that it can be converted into any desired shape. It has excellent joining properties that it can be joined by almost all the common methods like welding, soldering, brazing, riveting. Wow! Now, it, it becomes brittle just before melting. It can be forged, it can be soldered, it can be rolled, it can be drawn into wires. So this copper material is really, uh, you can say, a uh, usable material available for you in the industry. It can be forged, it can be soldered, it can be rolled, it can be drawn into wires. It has good resistance to corrosion. It is a good conductor of both heat and electricity next to silver. It forms excellent alloys. It is reddish brown in color. Specific gravity is 8.93 and there's a melting point of 108 degrees centigrade, which is more than aluminium. These are some properties of copper, the uses of copper. And it is used for making cables and wires for electrical purposes, electrical applications. 
It is used for electroplating. It is used for manufacturing of utensils and making of copper alloys. It is used for making munitions and tubes in engineering industries. Okay, so these are some common uses of copper and its alloy. Now, bearing. Now, bearing is also a very important part because it supports moving parts of the engine. Okay, so let's start with the bearing and bearing materials. Okay, so let's start with bearing. We said that bearing supports moving parts such as shafts and spindles of a machine or mechanism. So these bearings it can be classified as rolling contact, that is ball or roller bearing, okay, and then plane bearing. These rolling contact bearings are almost invariably made of steel that can be hardened after machine. This roller rolling contact bearing. They are almost invariably made of steel that can be hardened after machining. Both plain carbon and alloy, that is, alloys are like nickel, chromium, and molybdenum steels, are employed for different applications. Now, the properties of a bearing material. Okay, what properties, what features does this bearing material should have? It possesses low coefficient of friction. It possesses low coefficient of friction. Then it should be hard, it should be wear resistant surface. The tough core. Okay, you should provide hard wear resistant surface for the tough core. It should have high compressive strength. It should have high fatigue strength. You should be able to be a shocks and vibration. You should possess high thermal connectivity to dissipate the heat generated due to friction between the bearing and the rotating shaft. Okay, so these are some properties that are required for bearing materials. That is. High compressive strength, high fatigue strength, able to be a shocks and vibrations, high thermal connectivity, okay, low coefficient of friction. So really good. This they should have good these kind of properties are required. So this adequate plasticity under bearing load, so this adequate strength at high temperatures is such that it can be easily fabricated. For this, we are finding it only we are doing for that purpose only, it can be easily fabricated, it possesses resistance to corrosion. Be such that it does not cause excessive wear of the shaft rotating in it. That is, the bearing material should be softer than the shaft material. Okay, now we having small pieces of a comparatively hard metal embedded in a soft metal. Okay, now it maintains a continuous film of oil between the shaft and the bearing. These are some properties that should be there. Maintain a continuous film of oil between the shaft and the bearing. That is important, and it should be such that it must cause excessive wear of the rotating shaft in it. Okay, and the bearing material should be softer than the shaft material, and also it maintains a continuous film of oil between the shaft and the bearing. So this is a kind of good. Other types of bearing materials like lead or tin based alloys, commonly known as rabbit metals, cadmium based alloys, aluminum based alloys, copper based alloys, silver based alloys. Non metallic silver bearing materials. Okay, so there may be some materials which have been we have repeated earlier, but we know that these are should these should be discussed as bearing materials in detail. Now, first is the lead or tin based alloys, normally called as rabbit metals. Now, they say that the high tin alloys with more than 80% tin and little or no lead. Okay. The high lead alloys with about 80% lead or and 1 to 12% of tin. And they say that how the alloys with intermediate percentage of tin and lead, like they say the typical composition of a tin based, a lead based alloy may be PB 75% as this 15% as in 10% only. And if you go about a tin based alloy, then you can say that as an 88% as this 8% of copper is like 4%. So there are these two kind of different compositions for this uh, lead or tin based alloy. Okay. Now the lead based alloys these are softer and brittle than the tin based alloy. The lead based alloys these are softer and brittle than the tin based alloy. And lead based alloys are cheaper also than tin based alloy. They are these lead based alloys are softer also and these are cheaper also. Now, tin based alloys have a low coefficient of friction as compared to the lead based alloys. Okay, these tin based alloys they have low coefficient of friction. Now, lead based alloys are suitable for light and medium loads, 
The stint based alloy is preferred for higher loads and speeds. Now this is the application from a technical point of view that this lead based alloy is these are softer. Okay, so they are suitable for light and medium loads. And tin based alloy is that it is you can say comparatively stronger and it is always preferred for higher loads and speeds. We have tin based alloys are find applications in high speed engines because it can, it can be a more load and steam and turbines lead based alloys are used in railroad type cars. Okay, so this both the materials like lead based alloy and tin based alloys based upon their properties they are having their own applications. Okay, so that should be understood and that should be you can say a major point that needs to be understood. Now solid is temperature of tin based alloys. Okay, that is approximately triple two degree centigrade, two to two degree centigrade. And if you talk about the solid temperature of lead based alloy, it is around about 240 degrees centigrade. Okay. Now besides both these alloys possess this good ability to embed that okay, good comfortability to general that we need, good corrosion resistance, that is also a property we require, and very good seizure resistance. Okay, the so see these alloys, the you can say the features these alloys possess are very you can say uh, applicable for the industry. So they have their applications according to that. Okay. Now cadmium based alloys. Now chemical uh, composition of cadmium is around 97% and nickel is around 2%. Now they say that A, G, C, U, and Z are added in small percentage like okay. So these bearing alloys have a structure consisting of a soft matrix containing harder crystals of intermetallic compounds. Now, these alloys aren't very popular because of high price of cadmium. Obviously cadmium is a very costly material. So obviously these alloys are not that much popular because of higher price of cadmium. So these bearings they possess greater compressor strength than tin bearing alloys. Okay. Now cadmium based alloys, these these possess low coefficient of friction, these have high fatigue strength, they have high load bearing capacity, they have good wear, good seizure resistance. Okay. Okay, they have high load capacity, they have low wear, they have good seizure resistance, they have fair ability. They have fair ability to embed dirt. Okay. They have poor corrosion resistance using ordinary lubricants. They have cadmium based alloys that tried in automobile and aircraft industry and the results are obtained. So the most important thing because of that is that it has low wear. And it has good seizure resistance. So automatically it will more it will have more application in the maybe in the automobile or other industries, okay, because of the testing results. Now aluminum based alloys. The chemical composition of this aluminum is like 91.5%, then SN is about six percent, we use around one percent, nickel is around one percent. So good small amounts of silicon you can say are used to along with these. And the microstructure consists of NIEL. CuL2 in the matrix of aluminum solid solution. Now these alloys, these aluminium based alloys, okay, these they have what properties they have. They possess excellent corrosion resistance, they have good conformability to general, they have good ability to embed jet, they have good season resistance, they have good thermal conductivity, they have high coefficient of expansion. So these drop these alloys, these have these features which is really good. Now, these alloys find applications as bearing in diesel engine tractors. Okay, they these applications, these applications, uh, these alloys they find applications as bearings in diesel engines and tractors. Now the copper based alloys, the chemical composition of Cu is the chemical composition is around like Cu is around 80 to 85 percent, SN is around 10 to 15 percent, and Pb as lead is equal to 10 percent. Now the term bronze cover a large number of copper alloys with varying percentage of SNZ and NPV. The bronze is also one of the most oldest known bearing materials because the bronze is easily worked, it has good corrosion resistance and is probably hard. That is why it has its applications. Okay, now tin, that is bronze having 10 to 15 percent tin and the remaining copper is used in the machine and the engine industry for bearing bushes made from tin walled drawn tubes. And there we have copper based alloys, these are employed for making bearings required to resist heavier pressures such as in drain. So obviously these copper based alloys, we are having its applications in bearing, obviously 
but uh, you can see in real ways also it has its own application because it can help you to use heavy pressure. Now, silver based alloys. Okay. Now, silver bearings are produced by the electro deposition of 0.3 and 0.5 mm layers of silver on a steel component. You can see it's steel support shell with an intermediate layer of CU and Zn, the copper and nickel. Okay, so this is really interesting that these kind of like silver based alloys, these silver bearings are produced by electro deposition of 0.3 to 0.5 mm of layer of silver on a support shell, shell with an intermediate layer of copper and nickel. So 0 0.2, 0 0.02 and 0 0.03 mm of lead is then deposited on top of the silver and the iridium diffuses into the lead by uh, heat treatment at around 180 degrees centigrade. Now this covering layer aid in providing or you can say in improving this covering layer aid in improving the running properties, running properties and this corrosion resistance of silver layers. These are highest prized alloys like silver based alloys are highly prized alloys. They have the uh, they are in, uh, employed where other materials don't produce satisfactory results and these alloys are used on the connecting rod bearings of uh, aircraft engines. So you can understand this application of the silver based alloy is very vast. Now there's some non cotylic carametallic materials, bearing materials, okay, some non metallic bearing materials. One is Teflon and second is nylon. So in Teflon this here is polytetrafluoroethylene that is has low coefficient it has a co coefficient of friction that's less than K than 0 0.04 with our infiltration. So it has good stability at high temperatures. It is chemically inert to water and many chemical and solids. It is chemically inert, it is chemically inert to water and many applications or many chemicals and solvents like fillers like glass and graphite increases the resistance to deformation. So this is something really important. Teflon, very common name. We have also listened about this kind of material. Very common. Okay, it has good stability at high temperature, and second, it is chemically inert to water and many chemicals and solvents, fillers like glass and graphite, and increases the resistance to deformation. Then the nylon, another non metallic bearing material, nylon. And these nylon bearings have coefficient of friction around 0.15 to 0.33 for dry friction, 0.14 to 0.18 with water lubrication, and 0.09 to 0.14 for oil lubrication. With load of around 525 newton and with a relative velocity of 2.5 to 110 meters per minute. Okay, so these have their applications. Now we go about the tin and its alloys. See, the study of tin is also very important because it is also a very uh, common, you can say, uh, alloy. Uh, uh, tin is a very common, and tin alloys are very commonly used. Now, tin has atomic number of around 50. And its atomic weight is around 118.71. Now, tin, that is shown as SN, is a relatively soft and ductile matter. What is it? Tin, it is relatively soft and ductile matter with a silvery white color. It has density of around 7.29 grams per centimeter cube. It has low melting point of 31.80 degrees centigrade. It is allotropic in nature. It is normally extracted from cassiterite. Okay. You can see the uh, silvery white color in the diagram also. Okay, and you can see the you can see the symbol that is SN that is used for this tin, along with this atomic number and its uh, atomic number and atomic weight in the diagram. Okay, okay so you can see on the upper side of the symbol it is shown atomic number 50, and on the bottom side it is shown the atomic weight of 118.71, 118.71 uh, atomic weight. Now tin and its alloys. Again, this has many alloys, like some are like bronze. It is an alloy can, consisting primarily of copper, or commonly with about 12% tin, and often with the addition of uh, other metals, such as aluminium, manganese, nickel, or zinc. These elements are added to, you can, if you want to embed some more uh, qualities of more properties. Okay, now next the babbit metal. Now this is also a bearing material. Okay, bearing metal, and it's one of the several alloys that are used for bearing surface in a plane bearing. Okay, so one of the several alloys that are used for bearing surface in a plane bearing. Now, galistan. 
It is a, it is a, it's a commercial liquid metal flow whose composition is taken from the family of eutectic alloys, mainly composed of gallium, iridium, and lead. Sorry, and tin. It is obviously tin based alloy, so you can say it's uh, eutectic alloy, mainly consisting of gallium, indium, and tin. Now, lead tin telluride. Now, lead tin telluride also referred to as PVS and PE or PV1. S and X T E is a temporary alloy of lead. It is a ternary alloy, sorry, ternary alloy of lead, tin, and tellurium. What do you say? It is a ternary alloy of lead, tin, and tellurium. Generally made by alloying either tin into lead telluride or lead into tin telluride. Okay, what do they say? This uh, lead tin telluride, you can say it is a ternary alloy of Lead tin and tellurium generally made by alloying either tin with lead telluride or lead into tin telluride, whichever way you find it easier, you can work with that. Now, tin and its alloys, you can continue with that. Niobium tin. Now, niobium tin or tri niobium tin is a metallic chemical compound of niobium and tin used industrially as type second superconductor. Okay, now let's talk about pewter. It is a malleable metal alloy, traditionally 85 to 99 percent tin, with remaining consisting of copper, antimony, bismuth, and sometimes less commonly lead. Okay, the silver is also sometimes used. Now, pewter, you can say it is a malleable metal alloy, traditionally 85 to 99 percent tin. Okay, and remaining is consisting of copper or antimony or bismuth, and sometimes commonly today like lead. The silver is also sometimes used in this. Now, rose is metal. Okay, the rose is metal consists of 50% bismuth and 25 to 28% lead and 20 to 22 to 25% lead or sorry, uh, 22 to 25% tin. Okay, what they say is rose metal consists of 50% bismuth, 25 to 28% lead and 22 to 25% tin. The smelting point is between 94 degrees centigrade. Okay, and 98 degrees centigrade. The temperatures are given both centigrade and in Fahrenheit. Okay, so melting point of around this rose metal is around 94 degrees uh, centigrade and 98 degrees centigrade. So the alloy does not contract on cooling. Okay, the next is the silicon tin. Now, silicon tin or SISN is generally a term that is used for an alloy of the form SINX or 1 minus X into SNX. Now, the molecular ratio of tin is silicon. It can vary based on the fabrication methods or doping conditions. Okay, let's say this molecular ratio of tin is in silicon is, uh, can be very based on the fabrication methods or doping conditions. Now, turn now it is an alloy of alloy coating that was totally made of tin and tin used to cover steel in the ratio of 20% tin and 80% lead. Okay, so this is how they the uh, various kinds of alloys that can be used with the tin. Then bearing alloy is an alloy of tin with about 7% of antimony and 3% of copper have proved to be the best material for plain bearing alloy. Okay, what they say? Tin with about 70, 7% antimony and 3% copper. Very easy to understand. 7% antimony and 3% copper. Okay, so these these three, okay, sorry, these two kinds of this, this uh, combination is proved to be the best material for bearing, plain bearing, running against a steel shaft. Okay, against a steel shaft. You can say that bearing alloys are also there. So, alloys of tin with around 7% of antimony and 3% of copper. This is the, among the best materials for plain bearing. Now, bell metal. That is a hard alloy you can say used for making bells and related instruments which are symbols. It is a form of bronze, usually approximately a 4 to 1 ratio of copper to tin. Okay. So, bells alloy is really used. Okay, it is used for making bells and other instruments. And it's a form of a bronze, usually in approximately ratio of 4 to 1 ratio to of copper to tin, like 78% copper and 2% of tin by mass. Now, tin based solder alloys. Now, Lead tin, lead based solder, they dominated the solder market until recently with the advent of tin based solder. Now, the decline is as a result of toxicity of lead. 
and to 10 lead in the loy of 61%, 61.9%, 10 and 38.1% lead melts at 26 degree Fahrenheit at 23 degree centigrade. This is the eutectic composition of the tin lead tin solder. An alloy of 60% tin and 40% lead is commercially available and is close enough to eutectic alloy. Okay, now this is a kind of a tin lead alloy. Then tin antimony. The family of solder alloy has a higher tensile strength and lower cleave than the tin lead shoulders. Okay, now the most commonly is alloy is now 95% tin and 50% as well as 5% aluminum. What they say? In this say the most common alloy of tin anymore antimony is like 95% tin and only 5% antimony. And what they do? This has higher tensile strength and lower creep than in uh, than in lead tin solders. So this is uh, a kind of a tin based alloys. Now uh, tin antimony lead. Okay, they say this antimony is added to tin lead solders to an amount up to 6% to increase the strength and mechanical properties of the alloy. So tin antimony lead solder alloys can be used when higher joint strength is required. So this is a kind of a, you can say flux available. Okay, so you can think that. Now we go to the MCQs because MCQs are also very important part of the you can discussion. Okay, so let's go to the MCQs. One minute. Okay. Now let's talk about the first MCQ. Then copper is one of the most widely used non-ferrous metal in the industry. Okay, this copper is one of the most widely used non-ferrous metal in the industry. It is soft, malleable ductile material with a very ground appearance. The specific gravity is around 8.9 and melting point is around 1080 So what do you think is about true or false? I think it's true in this case. The answer is true. Okay, the A is done. Now copper zinc alloy is like the brass. So when you think about that, it has 70% copper and 30% zinc. It is much harder uh, and uh, stronger than pure copper and is widely used copper zinc alloy that is brass. So it is true or false? I think it's true. It's true. The answer is A is zinc. For adding small amount of other elements, the properties of brass may be greatly changed. Like for example, the addition of lead, like around 1 to 2 percent. It's not flat around 1 to 2 percent, it improves the machining quality of glass. Okay, the addition of lead, for example, around 1 to 2 percent, it improves the machining ability, machining quality of glass. So, it is true in this case. The answer is A. Now, copper tin, that alloy that is called a bronze, the bronze, sorry. So, the uh, alloys of copper and tin are usually termed as bronzes, and the useful range of composition of 75 to 95 percent copper and 5 to 25 percent tin. So it is true in this case. The answer is true. Now, a common type of phosphor bronze, a common type of phosphor bronze has the following composition according to your channel like copper is 97 to 90 percent, tin is 9 to 10 percent, phosphor is 1.1 to 3 percent. So it is used for bearing from wheels, gears, nuts off. For machine lead screws, not short machine lead screws, pumps, parts, linings, or for many other purposes, it is suitable for making springs. So it's true in this case. The answer is true. Obviously, A is the answer. Now, beryllium bronze. Okay, when you talk about this material, it is a copper based alloy containing of 97.75% copper and 2.25% beryllium. It has high yielding point, high fatigue limit. Excellent cold and hot corrosion resistance, particularly suitable material for springs or heavy duty electrical switches, cams, and bushings. So, it is true in this case. Beryllium bronze. Okay, true. Answer is A. Now, manganese bronze. That is an alloy of copper and zinc and little percentage of manganese. The usual composition of this bronze is as follows that copper is 60%, zinc is 35%, manganese is only 5%. So this metal is higher, highly resistant to corrosion. It is harder. Okay, this metal is highly resistant to corrosion. It is harder and stronger than phosphor bronze, generally used for bushes, sponges, wheat pumps, rod, etc. And this warm gears, these are frequently made from this kind of bronze, manganese bronze. So I think it's true in this case. The answer is A. A is the answer in this case. Okay. Now rose metal, it consists of 50% bismuth, 2 to 25 to 8% lead and 
22 to 27%. Okay, then its melting point is in between 94 degrees centigrade and 98 degrees centigrade. Okay, so the temperature is both in degrees and 10 degrees centigrade, and this alloy does not contact on cooling. Okay, so we have to be understood. So I think it's true in this case. Okay, I think it's true in this case. Rose metal. Answer A. A tin. It is an alloy coating that was historically made of tin and lead for use to cover steel in the ratio of 20% tin and 80% lead. Okay, so I think it's true in this case. Answer is A. Now in bell metal, it is an hard, it is a hard alloy used for making bells and little instruments such as tambours, and it is a form of bronze, usually in approximately of so 4 is to 1 ratio of copper to tin. What does it say? It is a form of bronze, usually in approximately uh, 4 is to 1 ratio of copper and to tin, like 70% copper and 80% tin by mass. So I think it's true in this case, the answer is A. A is the answer. Okay, so the statement is true. These are the references which you can refer and increase your knowledge in this topic. Thank you.